I once knew a billionaire, or I should say, I had the chance to hang out with a billionaire, get to know him a little bit. We were on his ranch of 100,000 acres on the Big Sur coast, and we hung out for several days. We were mountain biking. As we were sitting around the campfire, and we're eating sausage and all his good food, right? It was, it was fun. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, coming, I'm thinking of all the cool things I could do with his money. <laughs> all the cool things I could do if I had his ranch. Man, I'd have a dirt bike track over there. Up on that hill, I would dig holes in the ground and create a Hobbitville where people could live and you could rent out. It would be so much fun. Everyone would want to come to my ranch. And I started thinking about presenting my ideas to my new acquaintance as we sat around the campfire. And just as I was like, should I say something? Should I not? My friend decided he would say something. And he, he went about sharing all, a couple ideas and he looks over at the billionaire and the billionaire was like, hmm, hmm. Can someone pass me some sausage? <laughs> my friend thought he had a better plan. I mean, if you're a billionaire, you got pretty good plans. You kind of you know how to manage your money and you know how to handle things well. Well, for our lives, the designer of the universe loves us and he created a plan for us and Jesus' plan is better. And he knows how he wants us to live. He knows what he wants us to live for and what that's gonna require. My goal for you this morning is that you would see and you would want a part of Jesus' plan because Jesus' plan's better. So this morning, we're gonna be in the book of Mark and we're in Mark chapter eight. And we're talking about the story of Peter's confession of Christ and then what Jesus explains to us, the definition of discipleship today. That's what we're shooting at. So we're going to go to Mark chapter 8. Up to this point, Jesus had done many miracles. He's healed people. He's fed the 5,000. He has, uh, he's, he's, he's visited lots of villages. And then he makes his way up to Caesarea Philippi with his disciples. So let's read. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? On the way, as he was walking. Now, Caesarea Philippi, it's a long way from Jerusalem, okay? Jerusalem is down south, and then up a little farther north, you have the Sea of Galilee. And up even farther, here's the picture, you have Caesarea Philippi. It's way up there. It's kind of like the outback. Now, for example, if you were to take, compare it to here, to Douglas County, Douglas County, you got Roseburg, and then you got Sutherland, and Caesarea Philippi is like Yonkala. But you got to walk there. Or, or, uh, or Days Creek, for those in South County, or, or 10 mile. It's a little ways, okay? It's, a, it's very far from the center of what they would call Hebraic Judaism. It's a long way from the temple, but just because it's out there doesn't mean people don't gather there, and it's actually one of the centers for paganism. See, throughout history, uh, the ancient Canaanites built a temple for Baal there. And then the Greeks and the Romans, they also built temples there. Temples there. They built one for Zeus and they built one for, uh, for Pan. Now, the reason they built the sanctuary for Pan is because inside this sanctuary, this temple, there was a cave. And inside the cave, there was a seemingly bottomless pit filled with water that never ran out. And they thought, this is where the gods are at. So the pagans, they revered this holy spot. And Jesus, in this area where there's multiple gods, far away from the temple in Jerusalem, this is where Jesus starts to speak up. And he says, who do people say that I am? There's these other gods, who am I? And he asks his disciples this. And his disciples say, well, some say John the Baptist, and others say Elijah. But still others, one of the prophets. But, but what about you? He asked. Who do you say I am? And Peter answered, you're the Messiah. And then Jesus warned them not to say anything about him. I want you to take a look at this right here. He warned them not to tell anyone. He took them out a long way from the religious people and said, who, who am I? Oh, the Messiah. Yeah, you got it. Don't say anything. I think Jesus went this far out because it did tell them not to say anything because he knew that once people started finding out who's Messiah, he'd start getting persecuted more. It would limit his interaction with his disciples. And he, I think he wanted to time his crucifixion to Passover. As soon as people started finding out 
they would be like, ah, let's go after him. And that's eventually what happened. See, up to this point in time, Jesus had revealed who he was through his miracles and his acts. And people have been asking, who is the Messiah? Is he it? And this is a dividing point in the book of Acts. People are asking, is Jesus the Messiah? Up to chapter eight, verse 28. Peter says, yes. And then from then on out, Jesus starts to define the kind of Messiah he will be. It's a pivot point in the book of Mark. So let's take a look back and see what kind of Messiah the Jews were hoping for. See, there's two particular visions of the Messiah that are in prophecy. One is a suffering servant. And uh, it talks about this in Isaiah chapter 53. And the other picture of the Messiah was to be a conquering king. Now, I don't know what, what Messiah you would rather have. Who would you rather have be your champion? A suffering servant or a conquering king man? I'd rather have the conquering king man. I want to be on the side of the winner. And I think that's the same idea that Peter and the disciples had. I, and we know that because later on they were arguing back and forth about who's going to be the greatest. Who gets to sit along with the conquering king along on his left side or his right side? They were arguing. And uh, when this <coughs> happened, when Jesus started to define who he was going to be, it wasn't exactly what the dis- disciples were hoping for. We tend to cling to our own vision of what we want Jesus to be, but we don't let him define himself or who he is. So let's see what the disciples find out as Jesus reveals his plan. As Jesus reveals his plan. Here we go. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this. And there's three things I wanted to catch on what Jesus is saying. He said, I'm going to suffer. I'm going to be rejected and I'm going to be killed. This is not in the disciples' plan. This is not what they were hoping. This is not of a conquering king rejected and killed. Not what? That's not kind of the plan. No, I'm not, I'm not going with that. And so Peter says, ah, hold on a second, Jesus. Uh, now, Jesus, because he spoke plainly about these things, Jesus did. And then Peter, he took him aside and he began to rebuke him. By the way, God, by the way, I, I've, I've thought about this. This is not the direction you want to go. Hold on a second, God. I, I'm not sure you really know what you're, you're talking about. Here's a better plan, Jesus. Here's a better way to go. I don't, I, have you ever done that when you come to God and you're praying? You got some issue in your life. You got some thing. It's like, oh, I'm not sure about that. I'm not ready to pray yet, God. Let me figure it out in my head. Okay, got it. Now I got it, God. Now I want you to do this. Is that how you interact with God sometimes? Maybe if you get in an argument with your significant other and they say like oh god okay i i pray that they would repent come crawling back on their knees and then i would offer them forgiveness i like that idea let's do that jesus so peter said and then and then jesus he corrects him obviously because this is god because jesus plan is better Here, here's what he says but when jesus turned and looked at his disciples after he, peter said this he rebuked peter get behind me satan he said You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Get behind me, Satan. Peter, Satan? Wait a minute. Satan? Well, Jesus had heard the words of Satan before. Remember back in the temptations in the desert? When Satan took him to a high mountain and had him look over all the kingdoms of the earth, he said, you can have all of this if only you will fall down and worship me. No, 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 no. I'm not doing that, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. Get behind me. And he says, Peter, you don't have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. And so what concerns do we have in mind? Do we have in mind the concerns of God or the concerns of humans? See, human concerns are personal. God's concerns are for his glory. Human concerns are emotional. God's concerns are based on reality. Human concerns are temporal. God's concerns are eternal. It doesn't mean that human concerns are bad. It means that God's concerns are the ones he wants us to have at the center. God wants that. Jesus wants to see his plan. He wants us to go after what he wants and not something else. He called the crowd to him along with his disciples and he said, whoever wants to be my disciple 
must. And this is where he lays it out. You want to know what God's concerns are? You want to know what Jesus' plan is? You want to be on the team? Here's what it takes to be my disciple. For me, I, I, uh, I wrestled in high school for one year. <laughs> it was hard. That's why it was one year. <laughs> the first week, I, I sweated a lot. And we ended up running through the high school halls for all week, two and a half hours a day after we got out of school. We ran, and probably each day we did between 300 and 400 push-ups. Mm, okay. The coach said, Sky and team, I want you to be a block of steel. I'm going to create you, and I'm going to shape your bodies in a whole new way so that when you're on the mat and that guy hits you, they're going to feel it. And you're going to hit him right back. I want to create you. I want to make you. I want to form you into something wholly new. If you want to be on the team, you got to survive the first week. And after that first week, 30% of the guys were gone. They were gone. See, Jesus' plan is better, but it may not be easier. So what does it take to follow? Well, let's see what Jesus says. He said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves Take up the cross and follow me. Three things. The first thing is deny themselves. So what does it mean to deny yourself? It means to oppose yourself, to, to refute, to, to turn down, to reject the desires that you have, to deny. I'm sure that last night my wife had less than three hours of sleep. It wasn't because she doesn't like sleep. It's because we have a little baby and that baby cries and she has a choice. We both have a choice to get up. Do we turn down our need for sleep? in order to serve a little baby? Well, yeah. So what's the question? What are, what are you turning down in yourself to follow Jesus? Now, I, I turn down all kinds of things. I mean, I have not smoked cigarettes in two years. I've never smoked cigarettes. Wait a minute, I don't get credit for that? Seriously, I have never smoked cigarettes. Wait, yeah, you don't get credit for that, guy, because you don't value that. I must deny the things that are temptations to me. The things that stick out and make me, I, want to, I should want to do these. I want to do this. No, you don't, you, don't get, you don't get credit for that. But the things that are temptations to me are not necessarily temptations to you. Some are sin and some are not. So for me, denying myself means asking myself the question, do I have to be right? Um... Do I have to be right? And one person I've actually had several arguments with over the past two weeks, I can remember, I see their face right here. I've gone back and forth. And the funny thing is I've never been in the same room with them. Do I have to be right? Some of the stuff you're posting on Facebook is hurting others because you want to be seen as right. What you don't say today <laughs> well, it may save you from an apology tomorrow. It may save you from an apology. For some of us, it's not saying the funny thing that would bring attention to myself and steal glory from another or possibly even steal glory from God. If we're going to follow Christ and imitate Christ and deny ourselves, it's going to mean sacrificing if we're going to disciple others, it's going to mean sacrificing. And for some of you, right now, you are sacrificing. You're at home. You're sitting at home. You're not coming to the church building. Well, that's normal. That's what we do, right? That's what it means to be the church, right? Totally. Church building. I go to the church building. That means I'd be a church. That means I'm a Christian. Meh. Nah. Yeah. Some of you guys are giving up meeting together so that the rest of the body stays healthy and safe. So if you're sitting at home right now, you're on the couch, raise your hand if you would rather be in a church building. Raise your hand. Yeah, they're sitting right there. Raise your hand. Yeah, high five. I'd rather be there. Last week, we met in the church office. in Middle Creek, man, I was so comfortable. I was like, this is great. I don't have to set up nothing. I just show up and sing and preach. It's awesome, man. We all loved it. Okay, now we're sitting at home watching this. God puts us in position so that we have to sacrifice what we want because of the circumstances around us eventually to bring him glory. God wants us to deny ourselves and sacrifice what is normal so that he can make his church more healthy. 
He has a way of shifting things and shaking up his church. And throughout the history of the world, the church tends to thrive and grow exponentially when major problems come and when suffering comes. That's when good things happen. That is good news, man. And I think denying ourselves and our comforts, the Lord is reshaping our ideas of what the church is supposed to be and to do. The gathering's important. And honestly, church, uh, preaching's important, but it's not the most important thing. It's only a small part of what it means to be the church. So I hope you're, if through the, the process of asking yourself, what does it mean to deny myself today? You're asking, what does it mean for me to be a part of the church? What does it mean for me to meet separately, to pray for others? Maybe this is a time where the Lord is, is, uh, is reshaping your spirituality. This picture as I was praying for, for this meeting right here and I was praying for you guys as you're sitting at home, I had this, especially for Christians, pe- pe- people have been a, a followers for a long time, this picture of a, a frozen river and there was, there was snow everywhere and the top of the ice was frozen and it's like God was, God was, he was breaking the ice on the top. He was breaking it up because just below the ice was a deep, and flowing river of him that somehow we had forgotten because we get caught up with the things of this world. We get caught up with the things that make church normal for us, which is a nice cushy green chair here in Sutherland or a hard black chair in South Umqua. For some of us, denying ourselves means denying my own comforts. I'd rather not invite the neighbor over because I'd have to clean my house. That'd take at least an hour. Actually, probably like three hours. I don't want to do that. It's like work, man. I'm not doing that. Uh, it means denying, my, uh, denying myself my time. I'd rather not make the phone call this afternoon to connect with that one person who feels isolated and who's home alone. But deny yourself. Pick up the phone. It may mean denying myself for my finances. I'd rather not spend $100 on groceries for that person who can't get out. I'd rather put it in the dirt bike fund, man. I want an XR250, mid-80s right? I'd much rather do that. (laughs) It may mean saying no to even though I'm feeling hurt, even though someone hurts me, not standing up to defend myself. Did Jesus defend himself? Not before he got crucified. It may mean sacrificing my necessity to feel heard and understood. Did Jesus feel understood? Was he understood? When Pilate asked him, hey, if you don't speak up, you realize what's going to happen to you? He didn't. He didn't speak up. He kept his mouth shut. What's that mean for us? John Piper says in his book, Hunger for God, that the the greatest enemy of hunger for God is not poison, but apple pie. In other words, it's it's not the things that are outside of us that shoot in and try to get in at us, especially in America. We're not getting opposed. We're not getting opposition against us. It's apple pie. It's the desire for a cherry, man. I want a cherry. I want it to taste good. It's the selfishness in me. The temptation for when I get home last night at 6.30, I was like tired. I want to watch TV and eat pizza. Well, my kids haven't been in bed yet. Well, guess what? I'm not watching TV and eating pizza. <laughs> it's not happening. It's a temptation to fill up my spiritual hunger with physical, physical or emotional pleasures. When, I, when Jesus says, I want you to deny yourself, what you're really saying is he's saying, say no. Say no. There's a picture right here of a kid sitting in front of a marshmallow. If you've ever seen the, the marshmallow experiment that some guys did a while back, and it's been replicated multiple times, the marshmallow experiment, you take a kid who's under five years old, and you bring him in a room, and you put this marshmallow in front of him and say, hey, you can have this marshmallow. Oh, doesn't that look good, right? Now, you can have this now, but I'm going to leave, and if when I come back in five minutes, if that marshmallow is still there, I'll give you two. Two marshmallows. What do you think? <laughs> What do you think? Oh, man, this is what the kids like. They just get sit there. Look at my temptation right now. <laughs> Woo! You can, if you watch the videos of this on YouTube, it's so much fun. They're like, lick, they're like, but they can't touch it with their tongues. They're like, oh, I want it. No, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I want the more. These same experimenters, they, they kept track of the kids who denied themselves. And several years later, the kids who were able to, to hold back, to delay their gratification for the second marshmallow, they were overall more successful in life. 
Delayed gratification is the root of all discipline. I'll say that again. Delayed gratification is the root of all discipline. <laughs> I was so proud of my son uh, last week. I, I got ice cream out and I was like, oh man, I'm so hungry. This is going to be good. It's like late night and I get it out. I pour it in, right? I'm going and eating it. And Joey's like, oh, you got ice cream? I want some of that. And then she sees, she's, she sees, oh, wait a minute. The kids aren't in bed yet. Sky, no, 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 right? And so Sawyer walks out and this is Sawyer's face, right? He's like, ice cream, ice cream, <laughs> This is totally, this is what he looks like when he's excited. And so I'm like, oh no, what do I do? And I remember, honestly, I remember the marshmallow experiment. I'm like, oh, here we go. Come on, son. And I say, sir, I will give you a bite of this now. One bite. But if you wait till tomorrow morning, I'll give you half a cup. And you can see his wheels start turning. His wheels start turning. He's like, I want a cup. And he waited My son waited till the next day. Delayed gratification is the root of all discipline. That's what Jesus wants us to do. Because Jesus' plan is better when I say no to me. Yes, I want two marshmallows. I want Jesus. He's the one I want because he's got a better plan. One of the, my favorite quotes that uh, has kept me going multiple times in times of temptation or trouble is that the chief failure in life is sacrificing what you want most for what you want at the moment. Chief failure in life is sacrificing what you want most for what you want at the moment. So Jesus doesn't just say, deny yourself, but he says, secondly, take up your cross, right? Deny themselves. They must take up their cross and follow me. So what does it mean to take up your cross? Well, you got to understand for the disciples, they had, Jesus hadn't died yet. This hadn't happened yet. This is what you call foreshadowing. Now, the disciples, they would have known what a cross was because the Romans, the ones in power, they had used the cross to oppress, but they didn't, like, this is the first time Jesus mentioned the cross. Well, the cross isn't like a cute little necklace. It's an instrument of death and torture. So the disciples are like, well, what do you mean? Uh, I don't know what you're talking about by cross. So they knew it existed, but they didn't know Jesus was going to be on a cross. But because for us later on, we can look back and say, yeah, that's what he meant. So, What does it mean to take up your cross? Well, primarily, it means saying yes. I say yes to the cross. And what happened when Christ took up his cross? Well, he said yes to opposition. The cross was invented by the Romans as an instrument, a tool for death and torture. And if you were on a cross, it was obvious that the government was against you. Most places around the world, many places around the world, that is the case when you're a Christian. Here in America, it's, it's not so much the case, maybe for some of you, uh, but opposition is there. That's naturally the case with the cross. The second thing that's obvious when you say yes to the cross, you say yes to suffering. The nails that they used for Jesus didn't just go into wood, they went into his hands. They went into his feet. He drowned in his own blood plasma as it filled up his lungs. Saying yes to the cross means saying yes to suffering, just like Jesus did. He said, this is worth it. This nail is worth it. This serving is worth it. When we say yes to the cross, we say yes to serving. Next is say yes to humility. See, on the cross, Jesus was fully exposed. He had a little cloth. That was about it. Fully exposed. You can't look cool on a cross. You can't have swagger on a cross. Doesn't work that way. <laughs> One of my favorite authors said, it's, it's impossible to prove that you are clever and Jesus is Lord at the same time. It's impossible to prove you are clever and Jesus is Lord at the same time. And that's definitely true on social media. However much you think you're righteous, It's impossible to prove that you are clever and Jesus is Lord at the same time. If you take up your cross, it means you'll have to give up your crown. If you guys remember two weeks ago, Pastor Craig, he had a a cross on his head, right? Or a crown, sorry. (laughs) Had a crown on his head. 
And uh, I, I remember, it's two, three weeks later, I remember, still remember for the sermon, he said, Scott, every morning, every morning when I wake up, I wake up with a, cro- a crown on my head and I have to take it off and put it down. You can't have the cross, you can't have the crown without the cross. Lastly, when you say yes to taking up your cross, you say yes to death. It's an instrument by which you die so that others can live. The cross, for some of you, it's the alarm that wakes you up to change your aging husband's bedding. For some of you, the cross is, <laughs> is the, the room in your house that you don't use for knitting, but for your elderly parent who can't afford a new nursing home. The cross is listening and caring for 10 extra minutes to that one person when you'd rather be at home watching ESPN. And I guess the reality is for most of us, this won't be a physical death because we're called to be living sacrifices. The desire to die, it's not, it's not a natural or a normal desire. It means you're giving up something in yourself, you're taking up your cross. It means you're not defending yourself to an understandable accusation, but instead of taking it to heart and asking if it's true, And some of you are feeling death right now. You're sitting at home when you'd much rather be in a church building because that's normal. That's safe. That's not dangerous at all. What society, the virus, the government is forcing on us and what we're saying this is reality is that God is putting you in a different position. He's shaking the dust off your trust and saying, do you trust me to be who I am, to give you a better plan for where you're at right now on the couch, which is about 50 yards from your neighbor who doesn't know me. From your neighbor who doesn't know me. See the cross, it wasn't a quick death for Jesus and for most people on a cross. In fact, Luke, when he records Jesus' words, he says, "Those, if you're going to, I want you to take up your cross daily and follow me. It's a daily thing. Not just dying to sin, it's dying to my own plans. There was a man named Father Damien, and he lived back in the, the mid-1800s. He was a, a Christian priest from Belgium, and when he became 33 years old, he went to serve in a leper colony on the island, island of Molokai. And for years, he cared for the patients himself. He helped establish leadership in the community. He dressed their ulcers. And after 11 years of caring for the needs of those in the community, he accidentally spilled boiling water on his, on his leg and he felt no pain. Now, if you know anything about leprosy, that's a problem. That means you have leprosy. He realized he contracted it and that was a turning point for him. He realized this is my cross and he didn't leave. He continued to work despite the infection and eventually died there. For some, correct, taking up your cross will mean death and I would be lying if I say I wasn't excited or even hopeful that some people watching today would someday give their life for the sake of the gospel because it's worth it because Jesus' plan is better His plan is better. It's worth it. So lastly, he says three things. The first one, he says, deny yourself. The second thing, he says, take up your cross. And lastly, he says, I want you to follow me. I want you to follow me. Now, following Jesus is nothing more than an initial take a step. He wants you to take a step. He wants you to get up off your seat. He wants you to walk across the road. He wants you to invite someone over. He wants you to take a step. Taking a step means acting on what's real, what's eternal, and what's for God's glory. It means fighting by dying for God's concerns rather than my own concerns. And now, Jesus has a better plan for your life than you have for yourself. The, the, the interesting thing about this next portion of Scripture is that when Jesus says this, he says, take up your cross and follow me. He doesn't just say, hey, leap of faith, go for it, I'm worth it. This is cool. No, he gives reasons. He wants to convince you this is worth it, okay? You're following me. It's going to be pain. Jesus' plan, my pen is better, but it's not easier. Let me tell you why it's not easier. Let me give you four reasons why you should give up your life, okay? Here's the first one. 
It says, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. A couple words here. Save, you want to save your life, will lose it. But if you lose your life for me and the gospel, you're going to save it. That means you say, your life's worth, it's worth something. The life you have now, it's worth something. You may have like, I'm, I'm, not, I'm all right. No, it's worth something. If you want to try to save what you got, it's not going to be great because it's just for you. If you want to lose your life for me, you're going to save it. You want to save your life? You save your life by losing it. It's worth it. One of my favorite stories of a guy named David Livingston, he was a missionary to Africa. He was one of the first guys who went into the heart of Africa and he opened the way, he kind of blazed a trail through the heart of Africa so that other missionaries could come in his footsteps. Now, he had malaria multiple times. He lived for months on end in the jungle. You're like, man, that's a sacrifice. I'm not sure if I could do that. Well, here's what he says. Anxiety, sickness, suffering, danger now and then with foregoing the common conveniences and charities of this life may make us pause and cause the spirit to waver, the soul to sink. But let this only be for a moment. All these are nothing compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. I never made a sacrifice. Doesn't that sound like the Apostle Paul? I consider all these things rubbish. He didn't just do this because it was an interesting idea or his own personal gain. If you look in Hebrews chapter 12, it says, for the glory set before him, for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross, spurning its shame. He endured the cross. Why? What's his motivation? For the joy set before him. Well, you Christian, us Christians, we have a joy set before us that we get. We get a part of that, and that's awesome. We get a part of that here and in heaven. A contentment that we are following the Lord and he's going to bless us for it. He gives us great joy. And uh, David Livingston, he said uh, in a a letter back to those who would want to follow, he said, uh, if you have men who will only come if they know there's a good road, I don't want them. I want men to come. I want men who will come if there's no road at all. What kind of world are we living in right now? I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. The stock market's on a rubber band, man. It's like up and down. <laughs> up and down. You don't know. 10 years ago, 2008, phew, it happened before. Did you know since 2008, one month ago, the stock market has gone up 386%. Back and forth. We're up and down 10, 20, 30%. I don't know what's going to happen. The world is crumbling around us. Jesus says, I want men who will come and who will give their life for me, even though there is no road. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but the good thing is, I know that Jesus Christ has put in you the DNA, the seeds of the church, and he's going to use you to innovate. Because that's what we are as family church. We're innovators. He's going to use you to bring the gospel to where you're at. So that's the, the first thing Jesus says. He says, your life is worth it. It's going to be worth it. The second thing he says, what good is it for a man, for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? What's, what, what, what's the point of gaining it, forfeit your soul? Is, is there an answer to this? The answer is, what, what good is it? Well, it's no good. It's no good in gaining the whole thing. If you have to give up your soul, your soul is of ultimate value. So yes, you want to follow me. You don't want to gain all this stuff. <laughs> Right now, we have an opportunity, a great opportunity to do a great evaluation. You've got time, you're home, you're alone with God. Maybe this is time to take just a retreat with the Lord and say, God, what's my, is, this, is this how I'm living? Am I living as if I have a different answer than that? A different answer than what Jesus is expecting? Let's look at his next motivation. He says, or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? Well, ah. Exchange. Your soul is not worth exchanging. I just read an article the other day. There's, there's, an, there's a, a ranch in Texas, 500,000 acres. Awesome. I can buy it for $725 million because <laughs> I got that, right? That's the, that's the same size as from Elkton to the coast, plus or minus 20 miles. Man, I'd like to have it. That'd be my kingdom. I call it the land of ump. <laughs> what can you give exchange? You can't give anything exchange for your soul. It's not worth it. Take some time. Evaluate it. And the last one is really interesting. Here's Jesus' fourth reason. If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, a son of man will be ashamed of them. 
when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. The Son of Man will be ashamed of them. Shame is a motivator, but the opposite of that motivator is approval and validation. And God says, I am approving you. I am validating you. You can trust me. Work for the approval of the one whose opinion matters most. These are four reasons Jesus gives for following him, for sacrificing, for taking up your cross. Father Damien, he started his journey with, with small steps in the Lord. In fact, early on, he, uh, he set his goal before him daily. And he, he had a, a, a picture of Francis Xavier, the prince of missionaries. And he looked at it every day and he prayed. He recited his, play, his mind, who do I want to be? What do I want to go after? And just this is a little side note, just for parents. What kind of stories are you telling your kids? Is it Superman, Batman, Spider-Man? Or stories of real people with real lives who give up life for the sake of Christ. One of my favorite moments at night is when I lay down with my son, I turn off the lights, I tuck him in bed, put my hand around him, and he says, Daddy, tell me a story. And I tell him stories of missionaries. I tell him stories of Hebrews chapter 11 and the people in the Bible who gave their life for Christ, gave their life for the Lord. Father Damien, when his other older brother couldn't go on mission because he was ill, Damien said, I don't know, I'll do it. He stood up, small step. When he got to the island of Hawaii and was serving the people, he realized that they were in forced isolation. Yeah, he meditated on that and he was the first to go. He volunteered, "I'll, I'll do it, I'll go. And he tried to leave periodically for errands. But the government forbid it. I'll stay. And he stayed. He said, I make myself a leper with lepers to gain all to Jesus Christ. Near the end of his life, he said, I remain calm, resigned, and very happy in the midst of my people. I am content. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross, spurning its shame, and went on to be with Christ. Christians, as we are sitting at home today, we're contemplating what is happening in the world. Give your life to something that's worth dying for, something that's worth fighting for. Because it'll be worth it in the end because Jesus' plan is better. His plan's better. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that you are good, Lord, and that you... um, are with us in the midst of trouble, Lord. We thank you that uh, even though this is like, this sounds like a hard plan, Lord. I'm not, this is hard. I pray, God, you give us eyes to see and ears to hear, Lord, what you have for us and, and the steps you want us to take. God, show us where you want us to deny ourselves, Lord, where you want us to take up our cross and follow you. Thank you, Father, for your word. Speak to us today, wherever we're at. In Jesus' name, amen. We love you, Family Church, and to those who are listening, we pray for you and hope that you will continue to tune in uh, on Facebook Live, on our website, and keep up to date with how the Lord is leading his church here. Bye. Well, Sky, that was some very searching thoughts, and I hope as you wrestled through that, um, the Holy Spirit was kind of whispering to you, what are some of those things that, that if you were sitting there when Jesus is giving this very challenging and very basic picture that what it means to be a part of his world and his kingdom instead of your own. And and the first next step that we're going to put in is, if Jesus' plan is better, then I need to deny myself. That basic idea of saying no. And you know, we're in a wild, crazy world right now. And there are all the usual temptations, but there's a lot of extra pressures right now. And, you know, when everybody is home and then there's all this high level of anxiety and fear and concern and a lot of our normal outlets, a lot of our normal activities are cut off, boy, there's a lot of people, (laughs) I was in the grocery store and, boy, there's a lot of people carrying out six packs of beer and, you know, some people are just going to drink themselves and try to handle it that way. And, 
And there are temptations to eat your emotions. There are temptations to, to just try to indulge whatever to make you feel better. And I believe if we're going to make a big difference for the kingdom of God in this incredibly difficult time, that we're going to have to say no to some of those, those reactions that are, I, I like this phrase, that what I want most is replaced by what I want right now. And, and that's, a, that's a great danger. I think it's also true that when we are cooped up together and there are no outlets and kids aren't in school and we're not at work and we don't have those normal social outlets, boy, it's easy for the pressure in the home to build up. And, and I think we need to deny that tendency to just say whatever I'm thinking or, or just to spit out that frustration. And that maybe it's the frustration at the government or the situation or, and, and you tend to take it out on the people you love, the people you're with. And I think that those can come out of long-term conflicts, but they may just be a spark right at that moment. So whatever it is that as you're walking through this struggle and Jesus is saying, let go of what you would sinfully or even just replace what God wants you to do with something else, say no to that. And the other part, which is the second part that, that uh, Sky was talking about is, what does it mean to, to give up your life to your cross. And part of that's going to be that, that you realize that you've got to say, okay, God, I surrender my life to you. I'm giving you what you're giving, you're giving me life and I am, so I'm going to surrender my life. And, and sometimes that feels like dying, dying to yourself. And so what does that look like in your life? Well, maybe it, it means looking like wow, there were people in my life group. I need to call them and see how they're doing. I need to sacrifice my time and energy instead of just binge watching some TV show or or doing something that would just be selfish. I need to to think of the other people in my life group. I need to call some people from church that there are a lot of people who are at risk and maybe just lonely. Maybe I need to call around my neighborhood and and check on them and how are they doing and, and begin to put your mind, Lord, what is it you want me to see in terms of your plan and what you're wanting to do? And then lastly, I guess I would say if you're watching this and you've just tuned in and you're not a follower of Jesus yet and you're wondering what in the world is this all about? And I think ultimately this is a message not about denial and sacrifice. This is a message about hope. The fact that Jesus does have a better plan and, and we can trust him. That once I surrender my life, even though I, I think that's such a painful and difficult thing, it's, I give that to Jesus, then And he not only fills me with his spirit, then it says he's going to be a shepherd to walk with me through it. And, you know, this storm was no surprise to to God. Jesus knew this was coming. And so our offer is that we not only have hope for this life, hope for walking through the struggles, but but we're going to have a hope forever. And, you know, this, this world has been shaken. And sometimes when things get shaken, it helps us to see how temporary they are, how we can't really trust them and I hope by the world being shaken, you realize that there's one thing that can't be, and that's our relationship with God. And so if you have any questions or if you'd like to talk more about that, about either of those things, how we can operate like Christians in the middle of this storm, or how you can become a Christian because you need hope and help when everything seems to be falling apart. And believe me, Jesus is plenty strong enough to hold us through all of this. So I hope that's encouraging to you. Uh, We'd love to hear from you. You can Email us at info at familychurchweb.com. Uh, we'd love to be in touch with you some way and encourage you through this crisis. Thanks for tuning in. We're so glad that you're joining us by video. And uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person. And I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really. And so we just want to say we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me, or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging, and we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So if you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that, and we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.